All right, good to go. Awesome. Hello and welcome to everyone. Um, this is the Friday Tech Talk from the Tech Academy. And today we have Dr. Brent Wilson with us, who is a professor of computer science at George Fox University. And he's going to be discussing web application vulnerabilities and how to protect your applications. And I will let him take it away. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Wilson. Well, thank you. Uh, looking forward to visiting with you and spending a little bit of time with you. So uh, let me give you the sort of the big picture of, uh, of where we're headed today. We're, um, I've done a number of these talks over the years and um, have, have addressed this particular topic a number of times. Um, and again, we're going to, I've made some changes to this but I really want to hit again the idea of what's called an injection attack. It is absolutely the number one vulnerability in web applications and we've known about it for decades and we still do it. So um, we're going to uh, we're going to dive in, we're going to look at the anatomy of it and I'm actually going to do it for you. I will actually compromise several different applications uh, just so you can sort of see how easy it actually is if you don't have the countermeasures in place. And so um, so that's the idea today. I know that we have a number of folks that are both um, current students, I believe. We have some that usually are prospective students, uh, possibly just coming in for the tech talk. So um, I try to make sure today we don't get super deep into code, although we will a little. Uh, so if you're if you haven't, uh, coded before or this is quite new to you we'll try to keep it at a pretty high level as we go and for those that have coded will will whet your appetite as well and uh, and then as we get towards the end we'll just talk a little bit about countermeasures and defenses and and um, and what you as a developer need to really be thinking about and uh, so anyway, with that, um, I have a number of screens and stuff to be sharing with you guys. So please forgive me as I do the sharing. I noticed on uh, Google Meet, every, I can't go from one share to another. I have to transition back through this uh, uh, matrix of people. And so there will be times in which we'll sort of screen thrash a little bit. Just uh, hang in there. I will try to minimize that to the best of my ability. So with that, let's uh, let's jump to this. All right. So um, web application vulnerabilities. First off, I love this cartoon. I love most XKCD cartoons, but this one to me is just absolutely classic, right? Uh, control, we have flown to the US and we've breached the target's house. They wrote all their passwords in a book labeled passwords, the fool, right? How people think hacking happens. It's this, it's this mystery. It's this amazing secretive thing that takes place. And how it really happens is, hey, look, someone leaks some emails and passwords over here on this message board. Hey, cool, let's try them on Venmo. Hey, and we're in. And that's pretty much how it works. So it's not incredibly uh, difficult to do, which is why um, we have a lot of individuals playing around with this. But, um, but today our focus is really looking at what is the, the absolute uh, number one vulnerability. And before we go that, if there's one thing that I would love you to get from today's talk, it literally is this slide and the next slide. And those two things, if you're not a developer, just understanding conceptually is going to be very beneficial. So this is what I call software development yesterday, or maybe I should say <laughs> yesteryear, right? As a software developer, we focus primarily on two cases. We look at use cases. In other words, how is it supposed to work, right? Um, when you click this button, it should do this. When you enter this information, it should do that. 
And uh, so how should it be used when we look at those things? We also concern ourselves with what we call the error cases. What happens if, if the user fat fingers their username? What, what should happen, right? Um, we, you know, when you log into a web app and, and you fat finger your, your credentials, it should come up and say, uh, you know, invalid uh, credentials, please try again. You know, something like that. How do we gracefully fix these errors? This is what my generation focused 100% on as we wrote software. And there are millions, if not billions of lines of code out there in production that think about use case and error case. The problem is we're missing one third of the equation. For those that are becoming developers now, you have to think about the misuse case not just how is it going to be used and what happens if there's an error, but how could it be manipulated in some way to create an unintended consequence? Can I create an unstable application? And because of that, what will that do for us? And I, I, it, it is the one thing that as a developer, even if you don't have the background to know, well, we can't use function XYZ because it's unsecure. Even if you don't know that, sitting around a table with the developers and, and simply asking the question, is there anything that we should be thinking about with regards to security in this development? Just bringing that to the table is going to get us 60% of the way there or more. Because the problem is we don't think about it. And when we don't think about it, we actually introduce vulnerabilities into our software products. And this isn't something that happened 10 years ago. It's happening today. And uh, there are software products that are being released today worldwide. And I guarantee you there's a substantial percentage of them that have vulnerabilities in them. Now, they haven't been found yet, so no one really knows. They think they're secure, but probably not. And so that's, even my students that I have at my university, I, I'm constantly just pounding this into them. When you get that job and you're part of a development team and you're sitting around and you're, you're walking through the design, you need to raise the question. Is there a security issue with what we're doing? And, and that in and of itself is huge. And if you take nothing else away from today, take that away, that there's three cases that you have to be thinking about as a developer in today's uh, industry. So we're going to focus on the most common vulnerability, um, especially in web applications. It's what's called an injection. And injection flaws such as SQL or operating systems or LDAP, which is a lightweight directory protocol, which uh, Microsoft uses. Um, these injections occur when untrusted data is sent to an interpreter as part of a command or query. In other words, you are trusting user input and you're not sanitizing it you're taking users input and believing that they're trying to give you the correct information and you immediately use that input without doing any type of sanit um, sanitizing of that of that data and that's where injections come from because um, if we're able to inject some sort of malformed code and you think it's my username, then chances are I might be able to get bad information into the database, which could then create even greater vulnerabilities. So that's, that's the high level picture. So we wanna look at what is this? So there is a site on the internet called OWASP, Open Web uh, Application Security Project. 
and they really look at the top vulnerabilities. This is an analysis from them, and it looks at, okay, as far as injections are concerned, let's look at these five areas. First area is the threat agents. In other words, what, what are the, um, you know, who could actually do this, right? Who could actually do the injection? And as it says here, uh, it's application specific, because if it's a web app, then you're talking about some sort of a user base there. Um, you can do command injections on, on standalone software. There's lots of different types of injections. Um, it, how easy or hard is it to exploit? So if we look at the attack vectors, it is incredibly easy to exploit this type of, of error. Uh, attacker sends a simple text-based attack that exploits the syntax of the targeted interpreter and almost any source of data can be an injection vector, including internal sources. In other words, if you ever get information from the user, it's possibly vulnerable, right? In other words, every single one of those attack vectors have to be secured. Um, security weakness, it's very common. Detectability, relatively average, and we'll get into the tech de definition there. But I do want to highlight the technical impacts. Is this, what kind of big deal is this, right? It's a huge deal. The impact is severe. Most injections, especially web-based injections, can co either completely corrupt the data, it, you can lose all of the data, and you can even create a situation where a hacker completely and totally owns your system, right? And that they have become an administrator. And so the, the impact of having these types of vulnerabilities is, is huge. So let's, for fun, let's take a look at some. And not from the technical perspective, let's look at some that that have actually been reported. So I just went out and I grabbed some. And here's one, this was last year. Um, some of you may have children who used to have Webkins. Um, and right, this sort of the little plushy toy, but you can sign up online and create an account and give them all your information. And then you could register your Webkins and you had this ability to do all these fun little things. Last April, so just about a year ago, 23 million user credentials were exposed due to a SQL injection, right? Now, you might go, yeah, it's Wilson, what do you, it's just a Webkins app. That's not a big deal. How many of us here, and do not, don't have to raise your hand because I know it's 100%, <laughs> use credentials for more than one account, right? It's, it's human nature to do that. And, um, and so just because those credentials were exposed, probably those credentials could be used for other things as well. So the, this is real common. Now there's a, a fun site out there called the SQL Injection Hall of Shame. And um, it really looks at at some, um, some things that are known that have now been patched. I thought, let's go take a look at some of these. So I'm gonna share real quick. I already have this up and going. I have to go through our matrix off to my browser, which, okay, if I share and then I go to another tab, does it tell me click here to return? Okay. So can you see the Hall of Shame? Yeah, I see Code Curmudgeon Hall of Shame. Perfect, thank you. Yep. You're welcome. All right, so anyway, here's a site that sort of tracks uh, SQL injections. So if we scroll down, we start looking at some, I don't know, let's look at some that was say exposed last month. I'm not talking a year ago, I'm talking last month, 26 days ago, right? First one here, um, there's one called Sonic Wall, and there was a vulnerability 
um, in their gateway and uh, you could actually uh, take control over those things. Well, everybody's like, well, I don't, I don't know what Sonic Wall is. Oh, that was the other tab that I wanted to have open. Anyway, Sonic Wall is actually a security device. Uh, if you do a search for Sonic Wall, you'll see they are routers and switches, and they're actually devices that corporations use to secure their network. Think about that. Here's a device that I'm going to purchase for a lot of money, and I'm going to secure my network. The device itself is unsecure. Right? They didn't know that, and all of a sudden they were able to find that there was that in there. Um, Fortnite or Fortinet, sorry. Um, a lot of companies or corporations use this for VPNs for their users, right? You have to do a virtual private network. It's it's to create a secure connection um, with, say, your company. And lo and behold, it had critical vulnerabilities in it um, that were caused through SQL injections. Um, what are some others? SAP for those <laughs> maybe in the business world, that's a big deal, right? Adobe, um, evolution, client management systems had SQL injection attacks, um, lots of different things. Or, or how about this one last month? The state of Washington, 1.4 million records from users who applied for unemployment were breached. And they were tied to, they used a third party, and their application had an SQL injection vulnerability. And because of that, that uh, 1.4 million records. That's not good, right? So I, I guess the one thing, I don't want you to think doom and gloom here. That's not what I'm trying to share. What I'm trying to share is this is incredibly prevalent. It's everywhere. And, and what really is so dis, uh, disturbing to me, we've known about this type of vulnerability since the very first website was ever written, right? I mean, SQL injections, that vulnerability existed from the very first website that attached to a database. So we're talking, you know, uh, World Wide Web, HTTP came out roughly 1994. So we're talking, we're going on 30 years and we still are not securing this particular vulnerability. And, uh, and the only way we're going to get there is people like yourselves. We're going to get there by simply educating folks to think about this. Even if you're not an SQL developer sitting around the table, hey, we got this cool idea for an application and we're gonna, we're gonna create this cool mobile app and it's gonna collect the data and it's gonna push it to the cloud and we're gonna use that for all sorts of data analysis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody at that table better say, whoa, is this vulnerable to an injection attack? And if the question's asked, then you can take the time to actually figure it out. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna share, I'm gonna go back. Uh, oh, actually, while I'm here, no, I'm just trying to minimize screen thrashing, but I just can't do it. <laughs> uh, it'd be nice to share more than one window at a time. Tab, have you tried just sharing your whole screen? Uh, Although, this is the, fine. It doesn't feel that thrashy to me, at least. Yeah, the, the issue on the whole screen, and, and maybe maybe I'm wrong, typically I have a very large resolution, so my windows are pretty small. Oh, I see. And this way I think it, it actually maximizes your windows in the yep. share. Um, all right, so anyway, a little bit about it. So a little bit of techie. So let's look at what is this, right? Now, some of you may have not written SQL uh, structured query language. Others may have. I just, just a real basic, here is, let's say, an SQL statement, which is 
probably pretty close to what's being used in most web applications for logging someone in, right, for credentials. So it comes in, uh, the user enters their credentials. It now populates into this where you're going to go select, you know, username, first name, last name. You're going to select the information about the user from some table, typically named users. <laughs> and then you have this where clause. And, and notice where users equal to whatever they typed in and passwords equal to whatever they typed in. And that gets bundled and sent across to a database. And, uh, and then from there, we'll, we'll look at what happens. I just wanted to highlight that for a moment. And really, for those that are code comfortable, it's the red quotes that are really going to be important to us in this. That's where we're going to be able to do some exploitation. So you notice it's taking the user data right here, and it's turning it into a string by putting those single uh, quotes on the outside. So is there a way we can manipulate that? And the answer is yes, absolutely there is. And so we will take a look at that. Before we dive in, I do want to let you know that there's actually a standard for uh, for essentially for this particular issue. Uh, so CERT, your emergency response team, uh, cyber emergency response team, they have a secure coding standard, and it basically is this. Exclude unsanitized user input from format strings. Never use unsanitized user input. That's where the problem lies every single time. And so if you're using Java, things like format, things like printf, those are functions that accept format strings. And if you take raw user input, I can exploit that every day of the week and twice on Sunday, right? You want to avoid that. Make sure that your format strings are sanitized. Another way to put it is if, untrust, if untrusted data is incorporated into a format string, it can result in information leakage. Input validation must ensure acceptable values. All of this sort of seems like a, well, duh, type of a moment, right? I mean, we're looking for, of course I don't trust the user. Unfortunately, as developers, we trust the user way too much. And uh, because we're thinking that the user is trying to do a use case or accidentally an error case. We forget that there are users that are trying to do a misuse case, and that's where we get ourselves in trouble. All right, so let's do this, right? Let's jump in and actually do, uh, do some of these. So to do that, I'm now going to go over. We're done with the PowerPoint. Now I got multiple apps to start showing. Uh, let's go to, we're going to, uh, start doing some drawing. Okay. So, so let's think about how this works. If, so we're talking about an SQL injection and please forgive the chicken scratch. I'm working on my iPad here and, uh, I got my stylus. Hopefully you can read it. <laughs> if it gets really bad, someone yell and I will slow it down. Um, so if you think about what actually happens, so we have a user, right, who's interacting with some sort of a web app. And on that web app, probably you get there and there's a, a spot for them to type their username, a uh, spot for them to type their password. That is then bundled uh, inside of that SQL statement that I showed a moment ago. And that comes over and hits uh, hits the database. Okay, database. There we go. Okay, so now think about the last account that you logged into on the web. Okay. Your bank, <laughs> Webkins, <laughs> whatever it may be. Right. If you 
actually, um, if you actually did it correctly and you entered your credentials correctly, then essentially it's you're doing a use case. In other words, if I gave the correct username and password and it went to the database and it tried to pull my information, if I've done it correctly, then the database is going to return one record back to the application. Mine, right? Or yours. If you logged in, it's going to bring your information back to the app and away you go. Okay? That's a use case. Now let's think about what, what an error case would be. Okay? So we'll do an error case in purple. So what happens if I fat finger my username? Instead of Brent, I type Brett. I forget the R or something like that. When it goes to look me up in the database, there's going to be no match, right? Because that, that string doesn't exist in there. And the error case is going to send back zero records. In other words, uh, no match, right? And so the application at that point looks and says, oh, didn't match. So now I do my error case, which typically would say uh, invalid username or password. Please try again. Probably everybody on this conference right now is very comfortable and has experienced both of these cases. You've been able to log in correctly and you've probably fat fingered some things and not been able to log in correctly, right? So the question is, what happens in the misuse? What if I'm able to manipulate this SQL code in such a way that the database, as the misuse case, is able to send back all records? So instead of pulling Brent Wilson out of the database and sending it back, the database goes, oh, you want everybody here. And it sends back a thousand records. Now you have an unstable state. The application's like, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do with this. When, when I get one back, I let that person log in and away we go. If I get zero, I know there's an error. But I have no idea what to do if you send every single user back to me. And some databases or some applications will be like, um, you know what? You just gave me a thousand. Tell you what, I'll just grab the first one. I'll just log in as the first one. Anybody know what account typically comes first alphabetically? How about admin, <laughs> right? An administrator. So if I can somehow do this, then it's possible that I could actually log in as an administrator. And that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna do today. So um, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna demo this for you. Then let's talk about what I did and how, why it worked and uh, sort of become a little more comfortable with it. So um, at this point, let's go over to, and again, sorry for the screen thrashing. Need to go to this. Can you guys see Alturo Mutual? Yes, we can see it. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so this is a demo site, as you can see by the big red demo site only. This is an unsecure site, and it was built originally, as published by IBM to demonstrate effectiveness of their security products and things like that. But it's, it's, it's essentially this demo test site. And it purposefully does not have countermeasures in it for, uh, for injection attacks. Now, so let's say, let's pretend this was a real bank, right? And we come and we say, we're going to log in. We get here. 
Okay, now a use case. Uh, let's go, uh, I'm going to type in Bob. Uh, let's say Bob is my username and blah, 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 blah is my password. I'm just fat fingering stuff. This is actually going to show you the error case, right? That didn't match. So it sent back zero records. And so it said, hey, sorry, that wasn't found. Now, I don't actually have an account on this site, so I can't really show you the use case, but I can show you the misuse case. Let's manipulate my username. What if I came in and typed uh, Joe, single quote, space, or one equals one, and people are like, uh, what, are you, what in the world are you typing? And we'll look at this in a moment. And then um, I'm going to come along and I'm going to do, uh, actually, let's do that. I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste it down into the password. So I'm going to do that same thing and I'm going to hit login. Oh, syntax. All right. Let's go with one equals one. I'll do the double slashes, which are double hyphens, which is a comment you'll see in a moment. Type in some garbage here and then hit login. Oh, hey, look, I'm an administrator at this bank. Well, we could transfer funds. What account do we want to work with? Where do we want it to go? Um, we could create, we could edit our users, right? So we can come in and and we can go and find a particular user and we could start creating accounts. And notice, I didn't log on to this site, right? I did not have credentials for this site. So what I ended up doing was manipulating the SQL that I entered as a user and forced this particular database to send back all users, all accounts to the web app. And the web app's like, I, I don't know what to do, so I'm just gonna grab the first one. And immediately, the first one alphabetically happens to be uh, called admin. In fact, if I go to edit users, there's five users here. Um, you'll notice admin alphabetically. Now, if there was a user that was alphabetically before admin, then I would have logged in as them because here was a situation that the app didn't know what to do. So it just grabbed the first one. That is really common. Okay. So what in the world did I type? Right. So let's analyze that. Uh, we'll cruise back here. Okay. So what we did, and uh, so what we did on this is I, I really am exploiting, and by the way, uh, for everybody here, I will supply, I don't know if you want my chicken scratch, but normally everything I write up, I'll print it up as a PDF and get it to the Tech Academy if you guys want to um, basically attach it as a link or something like that to the recording or or however you want to handle it, just so folks want the notes as well. Um, so what we're doing is we're really looking to exploit the following. Remember back on that slide, I had select, and then some sort of column names were here from some sort of a table, and then the absolute key to what we're working on is this down here, which is what's called the where clause. And the where clause said where user uh, is equal to quote, and then inside of here was the um, was user data, what they entered for their username, end quote, and password, uh, was equal to, and then same thing, whatever the user entered. And they were, we turned it into a string. Now we want to manipulate that. 
So let's let's take a look at this. So let's start. The first thing I want to look at is let's look at a use case. All right. So what if uh, the user enters uh, the following? Let's say the user enters Bob and one, two, three, four, five, six, which by the way, is the most common password used globally, not just in the United States, every single country worldwide, that is the most common password. Um, please tell me no one's using that password. <laughs> if that's the case, what happens to this where clause right here, right? We wanna look at what happens to these two pieces. And what happens there is it ends up being this. It ends up being where user is equal to quote Bob, end quote, and password is equal to quote one, two, three, four, five, six end quote, semicolon. Okay. Now, if Bob actually exists and his password is one, two, three, four, five, six, this works. This is okay. Total, nothing wrong with that. It logs you in. Let's look at the, uh, so this would work if Bob existed. In air case, you could hopefully see that an air case is going to be almost identical to this, right? So let's say that Bob comes along and user enters, sorry, I'm getting towards the bottom. I gotta be careful here. Uh, let's say he enters boo, one, two, three, four, five, six, instead of Bob. The where clause is gonna look exactly the same, except Obviously, you're going to say boo instead of Bob. And if boo does not exist in the database, uh, password equals one, two, three, four, five, six. So you look at that, and, and those where calls are identical. So use case, if Bob exists, you're in. If boo doesn't exist, sorry, incorrect password incorrect username, please try again. So what's the misuse? Well, take a look at what I typed. Let me go to another page. I typed the following. So user enters, I typed Bob quote, or one equals one hyphen hyphen, right? And you're like, what the heck is that? Put it into the string and take a look at it. This would turn into where user equals, the first quote is part of the string. Now, what did the user type the user typed this and now the rest would be if you go back to the sequel it would say and password is equal to quote and then whatever i entered in is password and so for the sake of conversation let's say i just entered um one two three just so that we have something there. All right. So here's, let's break this down. The double hyphen in SQL is a comment. Just like when you guys write in C sharp and all those other things, you understand how to comment lines. When it hits a double hyphen, it comments everything to the end of the line which means in this example, by putting that double hyphen in, I literally have just 
taken that out. That now is gone because it's a comment and the, and the interpreter is never going to try to figure that out. So now I'm left with this where, so I'm just going to come down. I'm going to say I'm left with where user equals quote Bob quote or one equals one. Oh, not equals double hyphen. And here's what I have going now where user equals Bob or one equals one. All right, now you have to remember your Boolean logic. Remember your and and or statements? If you don't, if you're new to coding, go back to your high school algebra class because that was like, what, two years ago maybe, right? Uh, and you think about your ands and ors. Uh, in an or statement, now, it's a little interaction. In an or statement, when is an or statement true? Someone can unmute themselves and jump in. When is an or statement true? This is getting messy. I'm going to clean it up while you're answering. All right, y'all, don't make me answer. <laughs> I might answer. Go. All right, go for it, Rick. Let's see how, if you have uh, well, that knowledge from your boot camp way back. When, bo when both sides are true. That is true. What else? When one side is true. Yes. Yeah. Unless it's an exclusion. With either side. <laughs> exactly. So Either in one. A, it, not an exclusive or, but in a traditional uh, or statement, the only time in which it's false is when both conditions are false. Right? It is true in all other cases, when they're both true or when either one of them is true. Okay. So knowing that, I now come back. And if I'm truly trying to hack this and I don't have an account, uh, I just am throwing some bogus name up there. So for the sake of conversation, let's assume that there is no user named Bob, right? So this is going to end up being false. Users Bob, it, it doesn't exist. So I have false or when is one equal to one? 100% of the time, that is true. So now I have false or true, which, given our truth table, is true. So what I have done is, by doing this SQL, I've literally turned the condition statement into that. And so the, the where clause, which is a filter statement where you're filtering which records you're wanting to see, I was able to completely nullify any filter whatsoever and simply said, please give me all accounts. In other words, get me these columns from this table where true, which basically means nothing in SQL other than, okay, here's everything. And so that creates uh, that creates the uh, the attack there. Um, questions, comments. I know I've just been yakking. We're we're. Uh, I'm going to go a few more minutes. Uh, I wanted to just show you a couple things. Get over and do another one of these on a uh, on another system. But I just wanted before I leave this page. I'm hoping that made some sense for most of you. And uh, even if you're not code comfortable, just understanding this concept of misuse, I'm sending stuff in that once it gets integrated into that SQL statement, it literally starts to manipulate it and it nullifies my search criteria. So if we go look at this one more time, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And I'm going to go share one more uh, app with you guys real quick. 
So here is, this is uh, running on Linux. It's a uh, just a virtual machine I'm running. I have a, um, the, a web app that's up. Uh, so I'm in a sandbox, so I'm not using anything real. Um, and I could come along and say, okay, I need to uh, try to log in. So let's say I try to log in with Bob and my password. I just fat fingered some things. Comes up and it says, that doesn't exist. So that is a an error case. The misuse case is, can I do the same thing? Can I come along and say, well, what if I type Bob quote or B -B Bob quote? That will get me the first part. So where username is equal to that, that's going to be false because I guarantee you there's not a B Bob in this database. Or one equals one. That's where I'm going to get my true. So I'm going to get the false or true. And then I don't even want to deal with the password. So I'm going to type two hyphens, which is basically comment everything to the end of the line. Now, if I hit login, immediately I'm in. Because it's like, okay, it completely ignored everything, logged me in. Look who I am. I'm Alice. Well, that's interesting. I didn't become admin. I wonder why. Well, let's go and say, well, I can get in as Alice. What if I did the same thing instead of Bob? What if I came in and I want to come in as admin for one equals one hyphen hyphen? Right? So what if I come in, I'm going to enter admin as my username, and I try to log in. Oh, came in as Alice again. What did I mess up? Quote. There we go. So I come in. Take a look at the user ID numbers here on this. Admin, in this case, had a user ID of 99,999. So when we exploited the database and it sent back all of the records, this app did the same thing. Well, I'll just grab the first one. Well, the first one happened to be Alice. And so I got in as Alice. All right. Now, I'm going to show you one quick thing, and then we'll just sort of open it up for for. Q&A and chat, and, and I'll hang around for a while for those that want to chat. Um, there's a salary here. Hmm. I, that's interesting. I wonder if I can increase Alice's salary, right? So what if I come in as Alice? So I'm going to log out, pretend I didn't get in as admin. So I'm going to go back to, you know, Bob, um, Bob. <laughs> Let's log in. Let's say, oops, what happened? Syntax error. Let's go back. That's because I didn't use space afterwards. There we go. So I'm in as Alice. And I think, okay, I wonder if I can change my salary. Typically, a user can't do that. But I do have the ability to edit my own profile. So let's go see what I can do. So if I edit the profile, what well, only lets me enter the nickname or email, I have no salary here. Well, for those who write SQL, and I'm not going to write it all up because just based on time, but instead of a select statement, something like this is using what's called an update statement. And so it's updating these things. We can still do an SQL injection in the middle of an update. Let's have it update a field that's not listed here. So what if in the nickname, I come along and say, well, I'm going to do a single quote. I don't care about my nickname. And then a comma. And I want my salary to be equal to, uh, instead of 20000 how about 80000 
I'm putting it into nickname, but again, I'm manipulating the SQL. And if I hit save, hey, sweet, right? I'm Alice. I just bumped my salary up because this site is vulnerable to an injection attack. Here's the issue, and I'll sort of bring this to closure here. The issue with injection attacks are, in fact, let me just stop my sharing and I'll just come back here. The main issue with these injection attacks really comes because if, if you think of the history of the web for a moment, right? So 1994, not the history of the internet. You guys know that. That was 1969. Okay. So <laughs> 1994, uh, HTTP, right? Hypertext Transfer Protocol. The web comes out. And all of a sudden, who writes web pages back then, right? Only uber techie people because, oh my gosh, HTML, right? It was, it was, it was this mystery. It was mystique. No one knew how to do it. And then over time, all of a sudden web pages, instead of web pages always looking like Craigslist, right? All of a sudden they started getting really cool and they were graphic and they had all these really neat things. And all of us developers, we don't do cool graphic stuff, right? We are horrible at that. So all of a sudden we started reaching out and we got graphic designers involved. And so you started getting these, this mix of, of skill sets and you brought them together and the, and the, the developers still wrote the main HTML and the graphic artist really did the cool graphic stuff and it came together. And then all of a sudden folks like Adobe comes into play. You have Dreamweaver, you have all of these cool uh, web um, graphical interface design apps. And what has happened over time is that corporations, small startups, typically don't go and get a developer to create their web space. They typically get a graphic designer or someone in that arena that can use a cool tool like Photoshop or Dreamweaver or whatever and put together these really cool websites. Guess what the graphic designer doesn't understand? Injection attacks. And so all of a sudden we're rolling websites out every day thousands, hundreds of thousands of websites roll out every day. And the vast majority of those have massive vulnerabilities because they're not being developed by developers. And so um, are we going to turn that back around? No, because I can never make something look as cool as my son who's a graphic artist. He will always win because it will look better. Mine will be secure, but his will look better. <laughs> and so those are things uh, I think we have to think about. And so hopefully some of you, maybe you can cross the divide. Maybe you're cool graphics guys and gals, but also understand the foundation of coding. So anyway, that takes us almost to an hour. I've just yacked for an hour. Unbelievable. Um, but thoughts, questions? concerns Pat. i have a question um that was really really interesting thank you so much um first of all and um you were yakking but i was very captivated um and i've heard of sql injections but i didn't quite understand how they worked um and now i feel like i totally understand how they work but um when you brought up the webkins um site i was kind of thinking about and i think you may have answered this by bringing up that site that just logged all of the different um, SQL or the different like vulnerability fixes that have happened. Right. But I'm wondering if like, if there's any way to kind of look at a site um, and have an idea about how much security they've taken into account when creating that site, you know, like if I were to create a username and password for Webkins, I definitely would not you know, I know I shouldn't repeat passwords, but I definitely wouldn't use the same password as like my bank login, but I might use the same password as some other, you know, silly application or website as right. well. But it looks like even 
really, really high tech and companies have these um, vulnerabilities as well. They do. Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, I think probably most of you are familiar with some, at least some level of content management systems, right? Like, like WordPress, maybe folks have heard that phrase before. Uh, there isn't a month that goes by that there isn't some vulnerability that's been exposed in WordPress. It happens every month. And the vast majority are ended up being injection type attacks. And so uh, that's a whole nother discussion as far as if I build my tool, my app, by using somebody else's tool, even though I think mine's super secure, yours is only as secure as the tools you used. If the tool you used is not secure, yours is not secure. And, um, and that, that gets problematic too, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to sit here and do all those. Um, I think I took a bird walk and didn't even answer your question now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah, oh, just kind of like, can, and I think maybe the answer is no, but just from, are there any things that you would look for when you're creating an account on a site to be like, mm, how, how risky should I be with repeated passwords on this site? Or I, you know, probably just don't ever do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it, at the end of the day, first off, it is illegal for you to be testing these sites to see whether or not they are vulnerable to SQL injection. Right. You do that and they track you. You will be prosecuted. It's just flat out wrong. Well, that changes my afternoon plans. <laughs> um, However, I think a very good um, best practice on the whole password thing is you need to try not to use reusable passwords. You really need to try to avoid that at all costs. Um, you should, without question, make strong passwords, whether you're using passphrases, things like that. Um, the other thing is don't use searchable, identifiable information in your passwords, okay? Don't use the name Bobby if your son is named Bobby, right? Um, I drive my wife nuts because on our bank, our bank that we get in, you have to answer security questions every time you go in, okay? And she, it drives her nuts because they're, where were you born, all these things. And I make crap up. Sorry, I said that live. So, uh, you know, I'm born in Connecticut. Uh, the color of my car was purple. I'm nowhere near that, right? And so she's always like, gosh, where were you born? <laughs> but, uh, but don't use reusable things. Don't use searchable. Use things like, a great example would be, think of questions that would be meaningful to you that are not searchable. Where, where did you have your first kiss? That's not searchable, right? Um, you know, first concert. That's one I yeah, use often. Yeah, first concert. What was the first concert you went to? What was? Do some things that are identifiable to you and you only, and not searchable. Um, I, ever, I'm, I'm rarely on social media, but once in a while I'll get on there, and uh, I just. Uh, Facebook drives me nuts and I have to just get off after a while. But, you know, my uncle, oh my gosh, my uncle constantly does these, list these 25 things about you and share it. And, you know, and I immediately always jump on and go, hey, thank you so much for answering that. I was just thinking of breaking into your accounts. You've made it much easier for me, you know, <laughs> trying to get them to stop. Anyway. Um, I... Um, see a couple questions from Tyler in the chat. Okay, a chat. See, I'm not um, even. I'll familiar. read it. To you. I can read it to you as well. Um, he said, um, since attackers seem to favor chaining together multiple vulnerabilities, especially ones that are advanced like APTs, do you find that certain OWASP uh, slash common code vulnerabilities are favored in being chained with code injections? Uh, yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, he, here's the thing about, uh, attackers, um, return on effort, right? We're all about that. I want the most reward for the least amount of work. 
And if you can chain together multiple simple common vulnerabilities, you can get just as much access for a lot less work than spending a month or two months really creating this finely crafted exploit. And who knows, it may or may not work. I hope I answered your question, but that's that's where I'm coming from. He, um, he also asked, are, are error-based SQL injections handled in a similar, similar manner in terms of mitigation as info dumps and logins um, as you demonstrated today? Um, I want to make sure I understand that. If error-based, let's go. Uh, and Tyler, yeah. feel free to hop in and ask yeah. questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Too, if I, you want. I'm not sure I understand the question. I want to make sure I'm answering what you're asking. So Tyler, if you have a mic, you want to elaborate just a little bit? Or not. <laughs> I'm not. Oh, I'm not hearing from him. Um, okay. I, the rate I'm reading it, and this is also kind of a question I have, but like how do, oh, he says code injections that return errors that attackers can use to recon the environment, reconstruct. Oh, absolutely. Your, your air stuff has to be um, vague, right? Like a, uh, an SQL injection, a, a great example is I've seen sites where it'll come back and it'll say uh, incorrect password. You just told me that that's a valid account. Right. Oh, oh, I see what I see what you y'all are okay. talking about. So, it's like use the error code to then right. further right. hack. Right. Yeah. So you have to be careful that your air that your air codes are not disclosing additional information. One hundred percent. And and one of the things, and this is this is also tough for developers. Uh, SQL injections, uh, an injection attack doesn't have to come in from the front end does not have to come in from the web page. So people think, well, if I put all this uh, front end security, so I'm gonna write these JavaScript functions and things like that on the front end to ensure that the username is in the form of an email address, that's, that's the only username I'll accept, and then I'm secure. No, actually not, because I can snag that packet after it leaves your machine. And I can take that out and I can put my SQL in. So the security to truly secure these apps has to be done on the server, not on the client. Um, because I can bypass the clients. And that's that's a tough one for a lot of folks, especially what I mentioned a moment ago, where you have non-developers creating websites. They may think that they've secured the front end. It's not the front end I'm worried about because I can still capture the packet and I can still do an injection once I uh, get it after it leaves your machine. Because HTTP is transmitted uh, clear text. That's a clear text protocol. So obviously it helps if you're using a secure socket layer, things like that. That's obviously very important. So uh, when you're using the, yeah, secure, uh, SSL, you, you're encrypted, so no one's sniffing your packets till you get there, right? And then right. say you're using like Django in the back end, and you're, that does avoids uh, cross-site, uh, you know, cross -site that's your back end, right? In that right. situation, that would be a good way um, to uh, secure that type of app. Right, it, it would. The thing you have to be careful of is in your your app development, what are all the different, uh, whether you've used dynamically linked libraries, whether you've used third party components. Again, you are only secure as the pieces that you as secure as the pieces you're using. Which which means, ladies and gentlemen, every morning you should get out of bed and drop your knees and, and continue to pray that the Internet works for the rest of the day. Um, because it is duct tape and bailing wire at the end of the day. <laughs> Sorry. It's my, yeah. my, my pessimistic view sometimes. <laughs> That's why I don't like, like word perfect when you, when I start, you know, you always have to add these modules and then you get this module for security and it checks everything else, you know, um, 
then you kind of lose control even if you got control. Um, right. Right. And so it's hard to start at the bare essence. There's a site out there called, uh, there's a number of them, but if you look for common vulnerability and exploits, CVE as an acronym, um, you can go out and you can search based on product. And so when I'm building an, a software and I want to use a particular uh, library, I will search what are the known or fixed vulnerabilities of that library so that it gives me a sense as to how secure that is. Um, so CVEs is a place you can go. And if you, if you type WordPress into CVE, you're going to get pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages because it's, it's, it's huge, right? It continues, like you said, modules and modules and modules. How do those modules interact with one another? This, Module A might be secure by itself. Module B might be secure by itself. Put A and B together, and now you have a vulnerability. So good questions, Frank and Tyler. Tyler, awesome questions for sure. So Dr. Wilson, just kind of a general question here. With uh, business and organizations moving to the cloud, um, what do you think of the security of say AWS, and <laughs> Azure? I was just asked that question again yesterday. Uh, <laughs> I always just sort of chuckle because you're right. Uh, not putting information in the cloud, one could argue it's more safe, maybe. However, putting information in the cloud, uh, I would research the cloud services that you're going to be using, who's doing that. So let's take Azure or AWS, right? These are, these are big corporations with uh, a lot of engineers working on it. And okay, <laughs> this is a tough question. It really is because I've actually flip-flopped. I went from being pretty skeptical to at this point, I'm pretty confident. I would have no issues using uh, cloud services for a secure application. And the, and the reason for that is this. I look at it this way. If, if I'm writing my application and I'm going to host it, let's say we have our own corporate server and, and we're going to host it ourselves. Who's responsible for the security of that? Probably me. Okay. I, I'm pretty good most days, you know. But if I look at Azure or I look at AWS, we're talking about thousands, if not tens of thousands, well, probably not tens of thousands, but thousands of security engineers whose sole job is to keep that service secure. That is a lot more brain power than I have. And, um, and, and they're looking at it 24 seven. So I just look at it that I'm going to trust that more than maybe I am myself. I don't know if that's a great answer for people, but I, I literally have transitioned. I used to be not really excited about the whole cloud services and I, I, I hosted everything myself or if I'm working with a corporation and, and we do some sort of a consulting gig, I make sure it's on their servers. And I'm, I'm pushing more and more and more to the cloud now um, because I, I, I rely on, on their expertise over my expertise. So that's how I look at it. Gotcha. And it seems like everything is moving to the cloud just for just yeah. for um, for price wise. It's so much right. more. Um, yeah, better with the price. Well, again, it's return on on investment, right? I, I, I don't have to employ a large uh, amount of individuals to maintain those servers and services, I can outsource that. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, obviously I would stay away from Bob's cloud space, right? Um, you know, you really, I think you have to uh, choose wisely, um, young grasshopper, choose wisely, right? Uh, TV reference from the 1970s. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's that's the uh, where I would go with that. In fact, and the reason I said I had to answer it yesterday, that's the consulting gig that I said I might 
uh, that I'm bidding on is they're wanting to put together this whole app thing and data uh, data warehousing and stuff. And I'm like, you know what? We probably should look at cloud services is really where we should go with this and then be able to utilize some sort of a um, business intelligence tool on that for them to be able to to get some some good uh, data reports and things like that. Gotcha. Um, and I do want to vocalize some things that Tyler had to add um, to the cloud question. Um, he said that along with what Dr. Um, Brent Wilson said, that there's extensive security related teams, penetration testers, threat intelligence operatives, threat hunters, et cetera, all ensuring that they're safe. And another big thing that corporations love is that it transfers liability of information. So now it's Microsoft or Amazon that's liable if things go belly up instead of that company themselves. Absolutely. Um, I'm 100%. That is correct. Absolutely right on the money. And anytime, just as a risk mitigation strategy, uh, transference is a great strategy rather than reduction. Yeah, he said there's a few as a service um, concept or concepts or companies or concepts you can Google and they talk about what customers are liable for in each case. Yeah, Tyler makes some excellent points and and uh, to tag on, we'll just tag team Tyler and I'll tag. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> to, to tag on that also is is purely not only the security aspect of it, but the reliability aspect of it, right? In that they they will have redundancy built in in such a way that if something's going down, you know there will be a a failover uh, that they're able to continue. You as a company are able to continue operating. I've been I've been part of a company as a consultant at the literally at the moment they got what I call a BIF B I F F backhoe induced fiber failure and um th they went down they were a web hosting too they were a nationwide they were hosting a particular application within themselves the second that backhoe took out their fiber they are down and there was no failover there was no i mean they had backup servers but the fibers down and so um, the ability like an, actual, an actual backhoe. Yeah, an actual backhoe. <laughs> wow. It was yeah, not funny for them. Weird biff. Yeah. <laughs> backhoe induced fiber failure. That's what I call it. <laughs> These things happen. <laughs> they do. They do happen. Absolutely. It's very strange when things in the actual world interfere with our virtual world. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? This has been very enjoyable. I've enjoyed just chatting and yakking. Well, we can yeah. maybe save it save it for the next talk, but I'm just curious of your uh, thoughts on the solar winds attack. Uh, it's still going on. 100%. It's not over. Um, because they, yeah. Yeah, we can save that. That. <laughs> I have that's big. Yeah. That is absolutely the largest uh, compromise worldwide ever. And uh, yeah, it's still going on. There, there we have no idea as to the breadth and depth of that particular attack. Yeah, pretty scary. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Tyler, we wouldn't even touch it in two hours. <laughs> We'd love to have you back to talk about it, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I've been toying with some ideas because, uh, Kenzie, I'll probably hit you up. I'm probably maybe looking in a couple more months. I'll do another one for you guys. And I, I was thinking I I need – and so everybody that's here, you need to talk with the Tech Academy and Kenzie and, and give some feedback as to uh, – I don't want to do a presentation for which is not – sort of on target for our audience because uh, I don't know where you guys are with respect to your backgrounds and things like that, right? So, I, uh, but one of the things I think would be really interesting and I've not done this at the Tech Academy yet, and that is to look at 
the anatomy, true anatomy of like um, buffer overflows and what, why, how you can actually, how attackers can actually exploit and run malicious code. How, how can I literally smash the stack? Can I manipulate the memory within your machine in a way in which it executes what I want it to execute, not what you want it to execute? gets a little deep. So I don't know if that's w what this group would want to see. Um, I could probably do it pretty high level, but th that's the one I've been, we've been, uh, I've been doing a ton of those with my students right now. We've been uh, exploiting memory like crazy. So anyway, something to think about. I think it sounds interesting and we do have people at all different levels, but I think you do a really good job of breaking the material down and to being understandable. If I'm not understanding the actual code that you're putting in, I'm definitely understanding the concepts. Right, um, and this this would be, this would really be more of a high level conceptual and then I would actually do it. Let me actually break some systems and I'll show you and we don't have to get into the code of how that happens, but if you understand what's actually happening, it's, it's actually pretty interesting. So that might be something. Do people ever like inject directly with machine language or assembly language? Yes. Interesting. Which, uh, and that would be, that was exactly what we were just talking about, Kenzie, mm -hmm. is uh, I would, in, you know, I can do an injection where my injection actually includes uh, machine language. And so that way I can actually have it execute that code once it's internal into the machine. Even virtual machines? Uh, Technic well, if you can get to the virtual machine, technically, yes. But I can't get, but if you're running a virtual machine, I can't get to your virtual machine, right? No, I mean like, uh, you like know, hyper on AWS. Uh, good question. I will never attempt to try to do to hack AWS because I want to be here on Monday. Um, <laughs> well, it's a that's a safety feature, I guess, of that. Right, company. right, 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 right. And, and and for that presentation, I technically I would have to turn off some countermeasures, and I and I want to talk about what are the countermeasures that are, that the operating system already puts in place. All right. In fact, uh, most folks have heard the phrase "canary in a coal mine," right? The idea of a of having a canary down there because it would die because of the gases before humans would, and if the canary's dead, you got to get out of there. There's actually a canary, then we call it a canary, in your RAM. And if that gets killed through some sort of a buffer overflow, then the OS knows, stop, don't execute anything. It's, it's pretty cool. So anyway, food for thought. That's, that's for summer. <laughs> so anyway, or any other topics. That's the other thing, Kenzie. You guys, if you want to do surveys and stuff, of what are some topics? You know, I always just sort of run with what I like to do. But yeah, maybe I'll start um, like leaving a link at the end of the tech talk where um, y'all participants can kind of go in and let let me know if there's certain topics that you want to see covered. Mm -hmm. um, and I put my email in the chat box. So you're more than welcome uh, to email me about the tech talks in general, about topics you wanna see. Um, Dr. Brent, if you wanna send me any PDF files that come along with the class, I can okay. get them back to anyone that wants them and attempt to post them on the YouTube as well. Yeah, and Tyler, you're correct. If you, if you, can, uh, if you can pwn the host, you can get to the VM. Uh, so anyway, yeah, who knows? Maybe we could, uh, we can also spin up some other we could spin up an XP machine and own it in 10 seconds. Um, I think we need to uh, make a day tech talk all day long. <laughs> well, we need to wait till we get back on site because I'm missing the pizza. You know, that's <laughs> that's really what draw me draws me in. I know. It's so much harder to get people to sign up when I can't feed them pizza through a Google True. Meet. True. Well, I will say this. I, I mean, I don't know how long you guys want to go, but uh, I do want to say for all those that are here uh, right now, if any of you are perspectives and are looking into the Tech Academy in general, um, this is a great place. 
Um, it's, you know, I've been involved from day one, just looking at curriculum and, and uh, working with uh, both Eric and Jack and trying to, to ensure that you guys are getting what you need to be successful in the field. And uh, I've been asked by a lot of different uh, code schools and things like that to sort of give my stamp of approval and absolutely 100% the only one I do that with is the Tech Academy. So uh, just know that uh, definitely supportive of, of everything you guys are doing, what you're learning. Thank you so much for saying that. We really appreciate it. Oh, no well, problem. we do appreciate do appreciate your input as well. Um, the curriculum mm -hmm. is absolutely amazing now. And it's it it's is. been really good to see the evolution in the last few years since I was a student. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's great. These uh, Jack and Eric, they're doing great work. Everybody is that's there. So anyway, all right. Well, I think I'm gonna let you guys go if you don't mind. Thank maybe, you so so much. That was maybe I'll leave and you guys stay. Yeah, that was really good, Dr. Right. Wilson. We do appreciate it. Oh, you're yeah. welcome. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thank Take you. Care. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks so much to everyone uh, who joined from the Tech Academy or our community. We appreciate you being here. Thanks so much for your input, Tyler. Um, and yes. See you next week.